All right. Well, thank you for that bit of fun. And now we're going to um, get down to uh, the pre-conference information that we're all really looking forward uh, to hearing uh, from our amazing World Health Organization colleagues. And I'd love um, to welcome um, Elizabeth uh, and onto the uh, camera now as I'm going to introduce Mrs. Eero and uh, Fran McConville at the moment with their bios and then they're going to take it from here. Elizabeth Eero is the Chief Nurse of the World Health Organization, appointed by the World Health Organization Director General Dr Tedros Gabriesis in 2017. Elizabeth is from the Cook Islands where she worked as Secretary of Health 2012 to 2017. She was the first woman and nurse midwife to be appointed to this position in this country. Her top goals in this role were legislative reforms to enhance the country's health system, as well as the development of national health strategic plans and a national health roadmap. Mrs. Eero has a Master's in Health Science and Nursing and an MBA and was educated as a nurse and midwife in New Zealand. She worked as a nurse in different capacities, including Chief Nursing Officer, Registrar of the Nursing Council and President of the Cook Islands Nurses Association. And then thank you so much. And then I'm going to introduce Fran. Fran McConville has been a midwifery advisor at the World Health Organization since 2013 and is usually based at the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva. Fran's focus is on addressing how women, newborns and their families can access quality, equitable and dignified midwifery care that strengthens women's own capabilities, prevents unnecessary interventions and ensures timely referral to emergency obstetric and newborn care if needed. Fran's work aims to support the 194 World Health Organization member states to improve evidence-based quality care for women, newborns and their families ev everywhere. Fran initially gained experience in Bangladesh and then in Africa, Asia and the Middle East while being a lecturer in maternal and newborn health, gender and reproductive health at the University of Wales in Swansea. Fran is a midwife, a nurse, has a MA in health economics and social policy and a BSc in life sciences. In 2020, Fran was awarded the title Honorary Professor of Practice at Queen's University Belfast, Northern Ireland. Let's all welcome Elizabeth and Fran to VIDM 2022. Thank you so much. The microphone is yours. Thank you very much, Jane. And, and thank you to you and the team for once again hosting another fantastic celebration of midwives. Greetings, everyone, dear friends and colleagues. Um, welcome to this uh, pre uh, uh, International Day of the Midwife session with uh, with colleagues from uh, World Health Organization. I am really delighted to welcome you all to this virtual celebration for International Day of the Midwife, and I welcome the opportunity to recognize the work of midwives around the world and to say thank you for the respectful care that you provide to women, newborns, and families everywhere. As we face uh, increasingly challenging times, whether through war, pandemic, environmental disasters, displacement, or homelessness, the health of our worldwide communities presents us with the need for urgent action around the delivery of our health services, the education of our workforce, and the compassionate leadership that is needed to guide and strengthen our valuable midwifery profession. Last year, we were able to present the State of the World's Midwifery Report and the WHO Global Strategic Direction for Nursing and Midwifery. These documents gave us the data and evidence we needed to develop a roadmap to strengthen our profession. And today, we celebrate the valuable work that has begun to take place since then to implement these recommendations. These projects are starting to make a real difference to safer childbirth, safe abortion, and safer care for women after childbirth. At every step of the way, in challenging and difficult environments, midwives continue to learn, continue to lead, and continue to support the health and well-being of mothers and children. I thank you all for all that you do and wish you a joyful celebration. Thank you, everyone. I, I have to say that uh, we have a really fantastic champion um, 
with the director of uh, director general of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros, who has remained really steadfast in championing this profession. And I'm so pleased to, to, that he's able to join us through a message um, during this, uh, this celebration this year. So I hand over to for everyone to hear his message. Thank you, Chris. Dear colleagues and friends, today we celebrate the extraordinary impact that midwives have on the lives of women, newborns, and their families. We're also celebrating 100 years of the International Confederation of Midwives, which has grown to represent over a million midwives globally. On this day last year, together with the International Confederation of Midwives and UNFPA, we launched the third state of the world midwifery report. And at the World Health Assembly, 194 WHO member states unanimously endorsed the WHO strategic directions for nursing and midwifery 2021 to 2025. Both reports highlight the critical need to invest in midwifery leadership, education, midwife-led service delivery, and the midwifery workforce. This year, you will hear from extraordinary midwifery leaders in countries that have already started to implement these recommendations. At the same time, we must pause to acknowledge the many midwives who are not with us, those who put their health at risk in the service of caring for women, babies, and their families during the pandemic and other crises. We honor those who paid the ultimate price. I send my heartfelt thanks and respect to every midwife everywhere for your tireless efforts every day. I thank you. So uh, thanks everybody. I'm now um, just going to go through a snapshot of what's just been mentioned, the State of Wales Midwifery Report and SDNM recommendations, because as um, Elizabeth and Dr. Tredros has said, we have this tremendous few years of international year of the nurse and the midwife moving towards these big reports. But now our job is to implement them in country and really make the change that they that they were there to do. So um, just to remind us what they're about. Why do we celebrate midwives? This is the State of World Midwifery Report. And I think especially for these next 24 hours, it's because we promote the health and well-being of women, adolescents and newborns. In case anybody asks you, which they may well do, um, it happens. Put safe and effective SRMNH care really within the reach of more people. The obstetricians and pediatricians don't get out to the remote areas that the midwives do. And I'll show you soon how we could save um, an estimated modeled 4.3 million lives of women and newborns by 2035. We contribute to national and local economies through our work. And we also contribute significantly to women's empowerment and gender equality, because of course we are a mostly um, women's profession. So just as a reminder, because we don't remember everything all the time, the State of the World Midwifery Report, um, as Dr. Tedros has said, has these big four priorities. So education and training, um, health workforce and planning. I think really importantly this year, we have new language, and this is this midwifery leadership work, which you're gonna hear a lot more about, and this midwife led, we didn't have that before. So these are really significant changes in the policy language that we're using and are using at country level. And similarly, in the strategic directions for nursing midwifery, which the 194 member states signed up to, again, we have education and leadership. So it's coming up very strongly, as well as really much more jobs, 900,000 short of midwives we are at the moment, and service delivery. So that's just a little reminder. Now, feeding into all of that, I hope some of you remember um, that in 2019 at the World Health Assembly, uh, we had this tremendous event where we launched um, this framework for action for strengthening quality midwifery education for universal health coverage 2030. Now, really importantly, is this is not WHO sitting on its own in a room. Um, it took up to about three years, 
several hundred people, midwives and others were involved, economists, social scientists. And it brought together UNFPA, UNICEF and ICM with uh, WHO really for the first time so that we have this joint document. Now, what was so different? We've done education for, for many, many years. And what really is so very different is that education, often people think more midwives, quantity, curriculum. And that's where we've kind of got stuck. And then there's a lot of training and that can be effective or not effective. But we haven't really understood how effective it's been. We haven't really measured. Um, but this seven step cycle really made a big difference and um, to our thinking. And you'll see how it's making a difference in countries. For a start, we didn't put the midwife in the middle. We put women and newborns. And this comes out of the Lancet series of midwifery in 2014, because we really need to respond to what it is that women and newborns need in the countries where we're working. So really importantly, and this is what fed into the SOMI and the SDM reports, was step one is strength and leadership. We often have things happening on midwifery, but we're not leading it. It's been led by somebody else, as you'll find out. Um, and look at the policies carefully, what is working, what isn't. Get the right data and evidence in step two. We, we have some increasingly improved evidence on maternal mortality, newborn mortality, stillbirth, but we know very little about midwifery. And in these countries we're going to be talking about, we're finding out extraordinary things that we didn't know before. Then we think we can just move forward, but really we can't. We need the public. We need women, newborns, families, and their men on board. Uh, grandmothers, the people who, who control the purse strings and other things. We need parliamentarians on board. And we, of course, need the obstetricians, pediatricians, nurses with us. So a lot of advocacy to bring the right team to, to change this whole system. Then it's not just about start training in an educational institute. We know that 50% have no water and sanitation. How can you teach or learn in an institute like that? Many don't have materials. Many don't have midwives who are their teachers. Um, many don't have a practice setting, they're just purely theory. And many don't have any clinical mentors, a lot of work to do. Then we move on and make sure the faculty are strengthened. The standards reflect that the International Confederation of Midwives standards reflect the needs of the country. It could be that malaria or TB is the biggest killer. These midwives need to know how you deal with malaria in pregnancy, for example. Um, and then you educate. Um, and you can see we haven't, oh, the curriculum is, is just a bit hidden off that slide. The curriculum comes out of all these discussions and you educate. So you have all of this before you educate. Then you, of course, monitor, evaluate, review and adjust. And this is a cycle. And of course, you don't not educate while you're doing the other things. You keep doing everything at once, but you're continuously um, improving. So easier said than done. But very importantly, this is the first time we have ever had a results framework for strengthening midwifery. Um, and it's joint with UNICEF, who lead on monitoring of maternal and newborn child health, uh, with WHO, with UNFPA and with ICM. So I won't go through, there are actually seven, you can't see it all on this slide, but there are, the seven steps have seven indicators. There are activities for each, outputs for each, short-term outcomes and long-term outcomes. So we need to build this framework to be able to help governments monitor, get the baseline, monitor the progress and say to the donors, look what's working, look how much it actually cost us. Or actually that didn't work so well, but we tried something different and it's better and it's cheaper. So we've really got to, to keep this discussion going. So um, just to mention the five countries, we didn't just say, um, these are where we're going to work because we like them. We went through a process with ministries, with our regional offices to look at where these countries are in the transition to a midwifery model of care. They're all very interesting. And our regional offices worked with us to make sure there was capacity and that the government was absolutely um, on, on board. So um, the first one is Bolivia. It's still nurse midwives, but they are open to the discussion, which is amazing. Sierra Leone, amazingly, coming out of conflict and Ebola, has moved to a direct entry midwifery curriculum, looking good, but they don't have the systems around it yet. That's what we're supporting. Malawi, well known for being a leader in midwifery in Africa, good PhDs, master's degrees, but the mortality rates are not going down. We need to get the midwives out to those rural areas. How do we do that to save the lives that are needed? Pakistan's never had midwifery. It's nearly all obstetrics or nothing. So you're lucky if you live in a town and there's an obstetrician or a doctor. If you live in the rural areas, it's a traditional birth attendant, your sister, your mother, or you cross your fingers. So, you know, huge mortality rates there, but they're ready to move. 
So we're helping them with a strategy for how, how they could move to a midwifery model of care. And finally, India is a rising star. Um, a few two years ago, the government launched with support of WHO the first ever national strategy on moving to midwives. And we're, and we're at the beginning of that, but it is happening. So I'm going to hand over now to um, Aditoro Adikoki. And uh, Aditoro is our WHO consultant, who's our project coordinator for these five countries. And we're really so pleased to have Aditoro. She knows them all, been there, done it, and she's got good uh, relationships in many of them. And um, she, as well as our project coordinator, she has been a senior lecturer in sexual and reproductive health in the University of Liverpool. So without more ado, Aditoro, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, I'm Fran, and um, hello everyone. Uh, you're welcome to this um, panel session. And uh, may I say happy International Day of the Midwife to us all. In this session um, today, we will be looking at how these um, global policies and strategies um, that um, Fran mentioned, the State of um, the World and Midwifery Report, the uh, SDNM, Strategic Direction for Nursing and Midwifery, as well as the Framework for Action that was published in 2019, how these uh, global uh, policies and strategies are being implemented in various countries, the, in, the, in the five uh, project um, countries. Each country will be sharing with us um, today on the various interventions that they have implemented and that are critical to having a sustainable uh, midwifery program and their workforce, especially as it relates to midwifery leadership and um, education. Um, I've, I have uh, a very fantastic panel here from four countries. Uh, I don't know if you can show our uh, panelists, please. Yeah, so we have um, a, a speaker from um, Pakistan, we are from Malawi, we are from uh, Syria alone, and also from Bolivia. So I'll quickly um, introduce um, them to you. Uh, they, our first speaker today is um, Dr. Sabine Afzal. Dr. Sabine is a medical doctor and a public health professional. She's the director uh, at the um, Ministry of National Health Service Regulation and um, Coordination of the Government of Pakistan, where she's the Director for Technical and Health um, System. She has been working with the uh, Ministry for a number of years across various positions and portfolios. And um, recently, <laughs> an award and a letter of appreciation for our outstanding service to the government of Pakistan. Our second speaker is um, Madam Mary Augusta Fuller from um, Syria Loon. Mary Fuller is a midwife and has worked as matron in the government hospital for several years before she moved into the Ministry of Health and Sanitation in 1998. In 2016, Mary became the Deputy Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officer, and in 2018, became the Chief um, Nursing and Midwifery Officer. Uh, Mary has a registered nursing uh, certificate, registered midwifery, diploma in community medicine and health, and an MPH. Our third speaker is Mrs. Lenny Kamwendo from Malawi. Lenny is the founder of the Association of Malawian Midwives, AMAMI. She is a senior lecturer with the uh, Kamuzu College of Nursing, University of Malawi, as well as the external examiner for the Faculty of Nursing at the Mumbili University College of Health Sciences in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Last but not the least, we have uh, Professor Lorena Binfa, uh, Lorena is a professor with uh, the University of Chile, the Department of Women and Newborn Health Promotion, the, specifically the School of Midwifery there. She is a regional consultant for the WHO on this project, and she's working in Bolivia. Uh, my, uh, professor Bifa will be telling us the experience of Bolivia um, with um, this project. Um, thank you very much. So you're all welcome. Welcome to our panelists and welcome to uh, everyone of us. 
on, on the screen, you will see the uh, picture of the first um, national stakeholders meeting that was held in Pakistan. So we're going to start uh, from Pakistan. In September 2021, the WHO supported the Federal Ministry of National Health Services Regulations and Coordination to convene the first national stakeholders meeting uh, on midwifery. Uh, it was a very well attended uh, meeting by midwifery stakeholders, midwifery leaders, and midwifery supporters, not only from the national level, but from the provinces, as well as our partners, and including um, the private sector. It was an hybrid meeting, which was very well attended, uh, both in person and online. And it was at this meeting that the ministry requested that the World Health Organization, as well as other partners working with the government of Pakistan to come together to develop the first national strategy for midwifery uh, for the country. And that brings me to my question to Dr. Sabine. Now that uh, the government of Pakistan has decided to transition to a distinct cadre of professional midwife, what actions are needed to ensure that this happen and to make sure that we have uh, significant changes and impact? Uh, over to you, Dr. Sabine. Thank you. Bismillah rahman rahim Thank you, Editor Rowe, for giving this opportunity to government of Pakistan to share our uh, uh, situation of midwifery sector in Pakistan. Uh, as you all know, midwifery is a, a oldest profession, uh, one of the oldest profession. And in Pakistan, there are very uh, many different cadre and nomenclature used for midwives. We have lady health uh, visitor, uh, uh, lady health visitor program, the pupil midwife, the uh, nurse midwife, uh, and having various uh, qualification and uh, length of uh, um, and diplomas uh, in this field. In addition, in, 2000, in mid 2000, government of Pakistan also introduced the cadre of community midwife, especially to address uh, high maternal mortality in the rural areas. Also, there are uh, two universities which also offer post uh, uh, RN uh, registered nurse uh, bachelor's program for midwifery. In addition, these uh, efforts have resulted in decrease in uh, an improvement in the maternal mortality rates in Pakistan, and decrease in the uh, 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 and the decrease has been seen from 286 to uh, almost 140 per uh, thousand life births. Many efforts have been taken uh, in this regard uh, to uh, uh, strengthen and improve the midwifery sector in Pakistan, but still uh, uh, this sector faces many challenges. One of them being acceptance by the society, especially if the girls are uh, young and not married and in a rural setting, uh, delivering uh, delivery by uh, young girls is not uh, taking, is not very much acceptable. Uh, another uh, challenge is, this, uh, is the faculty, availability of faculty, skill development, uh, jobs, uh, opportunities and career structure. Uh, to address these, uh, being a divorce setter, different processes have taken different steps. Uh, we, um, uh, in SIN, there are uh, uh, midwifery, uh, midwifery led units has been uh, uh, piloted uh, with the private sector and uh, the CSOs, which has produced very good result um, uh, in uh, um, uh, uh, in addressing maternal, uh, uh, maternal and child care. Uh, SIN government itself has created posts for them, sanctioned posts have been created and around 3,000 um, community midwives have been inducted with a career structure in place. Uh, Punjab has uh, uh, reviewed its curricula and it's trying to bring in, in collaboration with the nursing council to at par with the international standard. However, um, as uh, although the midwifery sector has evolved over the time in Pakistan, where there is need to develop a strategic framework uh, uh, the, um, uh, for which we will request our all UN partners and health development partner to support in this endeavor, as they have already been uh, there for us. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Sabine. Uh, I can highlight um, three key issues that you have raised um, there. Thank you so much for your response. Uh, you mentioned the, the fact that there are multiple providers um, in uh, Pakistan and um, also not um, enough or required number of uh, midwives. 
uh, you mentioned that Pakistan is moving in the right direction to ensure that you have the right number and the right quality of our midwives. So it's very uh, uh, exciting um, to, to hear that. And it's also important that we, uh, uh, that uh, Pakistan as a country uh, moves um, faster on this. Uh, you've um, talked about uh, partners coming together to support uh, the government of Pakistan in the development of the national strategy for midwifery, the very first um, national strategy for midwifery. And we are excited to hear that and we look forward um, to, to seeing that. Uh, thank you so much once again, I'm Dr. Sabine. I want us to hear what is happening in Sierra Leone. Uh, Madam Mary Fuller will be telling us a bit more about um, the transition uh, to quality midwifery education in um, Sierra Leone through effective uh, midwifery leadership. Uh, which is what um, this project in five countries has uh, supported uh, the government of Sierra Leone um, to, to do. Um, over to you, Madam Mary Fuller. In the 90s, what happened, this, we started because there was no in decrease in the maternal death, we now said they were to train maternal and child health assistants. This we are now uh, graduate people, perhaps with just one or two um, O levels at that time, and they were trained for two years in just maternal and child care. They are with us up to this day, working in the most remote areas in the districts. The, the Directorate of Nursing and Midwifery is the leadership program in the Ministry of Health and Sanitation for midwifery practice and education. And it is responsible to govern, direct, and regulate the midwifery trainings, institutions, and the service delivery uh, facilities. Uh, since midwifery is a lifelong and hands-on skills profession, a good leadership is needed to direct and strengthen midwifery, the pre-service trainings, and the in-service trainings, mentoring of the nurses, and coaching of the, the midwives is needed by a good leadership. The midwifery framework, the WHO midwifery framework, has prompted the Directorate of Nursing and Midwifery in Sierra Leone to look at the midwifery education and practice holistically so that it will benefit both the midwife and the uh, beneficiaries who are the women and the children in the country. Um, it has also opened the eyes of the directorate to reactivate the quadra meetings, which normally deals with midwifery um, strategic plan. We will have out things that will improve the education and the and the practice of midwifery in the country. This quadrat consists of partners, consists of UN bodies, WHO, UNFPA, uh, Seed Global, the, the, the Midwife um, Association, and the Higher Education, the TC in Sierra Leone. So we all come together on quarterly basis to ensure that we track, we align what we have been doing for midwifery during the quarter, and we give results, and then we, our challenges, and we come together and see how we forge the way forward. Thank you very much, um, Mary, and thank you for those um, critical uh, points um, that you have raised. Uh, the one on holistic approach um, to midwifery education and practice, as well as the uh, effective leadership, not only at individual level, but having a core group uh, that um, speaks to the needs of midwifery at the national level. Um, thank you very much. Um, in, I want to uh, quickly uh, say that for uh, what, what we are seeing now is um, like a, a, a theme that is running through uh, this um, discussion. Uh, and it's, uh, the theme is, of, uh, is talking about leadership, it's talking about uh, coordination, it's talking about people coming together. And that brings me to uh, the question that I have for um, Lenny. 
uh, learning, we are, how has a partnership, uh, how has it been critical to uh, quality midwifery education in Malawi? Thank you. Over to you, Lenny. Malawi is well on the road to successful completion of the WHO five country project, which is focusing on strengthening midwifery education. Knowing that collaboration and partnerships are key to the success of this project, WHO has reached out to various partners, starting with policymakers at the Ministry of Health to service provision sector. They have also reached out to advocates, such as the White Ribbon Alliance for Safe Motherhood, the Professional Association of Midwives, the regulatory body, which is the Nurses and Midwives Council, and the training institutions themselves. WHO has also reached out to development partners such as USAID and UNFPA. WHO has made the purpose of this um, project very clear, to which is to improve health outcomes for mothers and newborns. WHO has ensured that the partnerships are built on a shared and common vision. That is, investing in midwives means investing in women and newborns. They have promoted the value of building synergies in order to avoid wastage and duplication of effort and resources. This can only lead to one thing, better outcomes for mothers and newborns. Success of one partner is success for everyone. Just as failure of one partner is failure for everyone. No single organization has answers to all the maternal and newborn health challenges, as well as the daunting challenges that midwifery service providers are experiencing in Malawi. But together, we can succeed. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Lenny. Together, we will succeed. I agree with all the points um, raised uh, by Lenny. We need to uh, come together. We need to work together. Uh, we need to take a multi-sectoral approach, uh, including policymakers, including um, service providers, advocates, uh, regulatory bodies, training institutions themselves, as well as our partners and having a shared and common uh, vision in order for us not to, um, uh, to, in order for us to avoid wastage, to ensure um, synergy and avoid um, duplication of efforts and resources. Because just like what Lenny said, that is only when we'll be able uh, to have better outcome for mothers and newborns. And I'm um, talking about mothers and newborns. I want to show us um, a video of a woman from Bolivia. Kuna Ranti controles Nikita? Oh, Ross, no, as the party than I take a machete. Nichi Minata, a chiso, man, man, and the man of shoe. Then you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so that is to remind us about the importance of having accessible uh, middle free care midwifery care at the very point of need to the remotest uh, part of the country or the world. Uh, I'll be asking uh, Professor Binfa about um, the situation in um, Bolivia, how this project will support the government of, of Bolivia to strengthen midwifery in the country, having a clear understanding of the gaps that currently exist. Over to you, Lorena. Bolivia is a plurinational state, which makes it a very heterogeneous and diverse country. Therefore, different strategies are needed to ensure maternal and neonatal center safe and respectful care within the framework of the family intercultural community health policy. In terms of midwifery education, to date, there are three universities that are training nurse midwives from which 385 professionals have been graduated. The development and subsequent labor insertion of this career 
have been greatly favored by the support of various international organizations, UNFPA, PAHO, and the Inter-American Development Bank, which have worked in close collaboration with the Ministry of Health and Sports. The project has recently started, but we have already taken the first step to come together among all stakeholders to guide and plan sustainable and strategic work towards achieving our goal that women from the most remote rural areas of Bolivia may have the right to quality services. Therefore, this project will contribute with and to other ongoing programs developed by these organizations in a close relationship with the Ministry of Health to highlight and put on the public health agenda the importance of this professional so that she is valued and recognized. We wanted to put a human face to our presentation because we believe that the best way to celebrate the International Day of the Midwife is with this testimony on behalf of all the women who can be cared by nurse midwives. Thank you very much, um, Lorena. And uh, I want to say very important um, statements um, you have made there. Uh, valued, recognized, distinct uh, professional midwife is key to enhancing quality, uh, quality care and improving health outcome. And with that, uh, I want to bring this panel discussion to a close. Thank you so much to all our panelists for their time and for their very useful insights. I want to thank you all for attending the panel session and I will now hand over back to Frank. Thank you so much, everyone. Happy International Day of the Midwife. Thank you. Adatora, that was super. And that is so good to hear from the countries. I actually love the woman in Bolivia. I thought that was great. So yeah. thank you. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Now, I'm really pleased because we do focus on Africa and um, Southeast Asia and, and um, the Americas and so forth. But we have with us a really special midwife from Romania, um, Irina Popescu, and she is the deputy president of the Romanian Independent Midwives Association. So Irina is a mover and a shaker trying to make a difference in Romania. And she's told us also she is the coordinator for the Refugee Reproductive Health Program. And this is for the women now coming in from Ukraine into Romania. Into Romania. Um, and their needs will be absolutely huge. So I'm really pleased to hand over to Rina to tell us about a few things that they've been doing and why it matters in Europe, where we don't often concentrate on actually the really huge midwifery needs that there are. Thank you so much for joining us, Irina. Over to you. Hi, uh, happy International Midwife Day. I'm uh, happy to be here. So uh, the story for today, it's about uh, MATE, the um, assessment tool that uh, was presented to us uh, by um, Billy Hunter and Grace Thomas uh, within uh, some sessions that took place last uh, summer. And um, for... I wonder if we're having some connection problems with Arena. I think so. Shall I just continue and let Arena pick up? And I hope she can come back in on the on the next slides. It's so, perfect. Um, Thank you. Oh, it's a shame to miss her. So, 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 what she was saying was the University of Cardiff, the WHO Collaborating Centre with Billy Hunter and Grace Thomas, came to Romania to help a very initial discussion on how they can move forward on midwifery with this midwifery education tool sorry, midwifery assessment tool for education. And it's just a set, it's very simple, and it's a set of 33 questions. And uh, Irina, can you hear now? Please do pick up if you can hear. Yes, sorry for this, it's my connection. It's not always great in Romania. <laughs> okay, so um, I wanted to let you know about um, how we work, how we, we uh, worked with MATE. Uh, we gathered around um, obstetricians, neonatologists, pediatricians, 
and also a lot of the decisional factors from uh, Ministry of Health. I was also working at Ministry of Health uh, when we did this and uh, um, also colleagues uh, that uh, are uh, in uh, hospital management and uh, decisional factors from the insurance company. And um, this, this was great because for Romania, since well, I'm active like 12 years ago as a midwife, um, it was the first time when this was happening. And also women and journalists, I forgot to say this, but it, they, were, they were the most important actually because we, we also wanted to speak with uh, mothers, uh, women who could benefit uh, of midwif midwife care. And um, and for us, the autonomy of our profession is still, even we, if we have legislation, uh, we have faculties, now they are getting closed, a lot of them are already closed, and we, we try to, to see the exact point of pressure that we need to start our, um, our um, change, because yeah, we need to change things <laughs> uh, to, to have better care for um, women and uh, babies. So, yeah, we, we go through all these questions. Uh, what is it now and uh, how it could be? And also we had students uh, at midwifery that weren't aware about um, full scope of practice for midwifery because we don't have um, midwives that teach midwives, but doctors that teach midwives. So we don't have, uh, even if we have, doctors in uh, in uh, midwifery we still we are not, they are not allowed to work at, at universities unfortunately so this is uh, disproportionate uh, things there and um, um, about the curriculum curriculum it's it's very good it's the same uh, um, mostly the same from from europe but it, it's also about who is teaching this curriculum to students and the practical part because the, I, I did the practical part in a hospital that was 80% cesarean section. I uh, never saw antenatal care in my practice. Uh, I, for me, it was good because another midwife from Switzerland take, took me in her private practice to, to, teach, to teach me, but this was, I was very lucky. <laughs> not everybody is so, so lucky, unfortunately. And also we are not looking at neonatal care for midwives. It's just the neonatologist and it's not about um, bad intention, of course, it's just about how things are. In, in Romania, we, um, midwife can, can work uh, near the doctor, but uh, the children, the, the neonat, it's for uh, neonatological care always. Unfortunately, and this is what we are trying to explain to our colleague that we can do home visit, uh, we need postnatal care because, of course, our colleagues are overwhelmed with physiological care for, for mothers, for uh, women and for babies and for breastfeeding and they're, they're really overwhelmed and uh, women are going to hospital uh, and primary care, it's like very close to <laughs> a low level, a very a too low level uh, that needs to be to be changed. And for for us, it was um, very very helpful to see that with with this tool we can uh, separate the problems. We can see the exact points that there uh, needs uh, needs uh, to be changed. The representation from the order of midwifery. They, we need to improve. How they represent us because it, it's not uh, it's not perfect. The point of pressure for the insurance company that don't sign contract with midw midwives, but we are getting close because we discussed and we we explained and they weren't aware of what a midwife is. It was just like this: the their legal part, their protocol part. They weren't aware about midwives and why to sign a contract direct with a midwife. And when we, we use all, all this argument, you know, the care is it's, uh, done um, in team to identify the risk, not, not to hide the risk because <laughs> they are sort of, okay, but you will treat everything. No, just our part and you will do our, your part and everything work better. And also in this team, we have to put the women, always put the women in the team 
don't take decision without her don't push the decision on her and uh, and take take good care of them in in team and this was a little feedback from uh, from our participants on uh, on mate i told you also about the midwife student <laughs> now i know what a midwife could do and uh, and um, they they also never heard about um, about an uh, obstetrician and an onatologist to say, okay, so now we need to work in, in a team because this is how we, we provide better care and everybody is more uh, efficient at his job, not, not overwhelmed. And um, yeah, also the doctor's college, okay, everybody, everybody, really everybody was, was at this uh, round table. It was uh, also online. But it, it was uh, very well organized because we were mixed together in, in rooms. And even now, after several months, we are still connected. Even if not every, every time the answer is yes or yes, we will, we will uh, collaborate. Sometimes it's uh, no. But still, they, uh, we are not ignored anymore. Because for, for this MATE tool, um, we, we really spoke together, we, we really thought, okay, but how is uh, more efficient, uh, how, how is uh, care at um, home after birth, because also we don't have this in Romania implemented and the results are not so good, of course. And um, I think we are aware now, every, every institution that needs to take decisions, that we have to implement midwifery at full scope of practice, as soon as possible, also in Romania. Thank you. Irina, thank you so much on that. And, and you just touched on so many of the points actually in that seven step um, action plan. It was really, really interesting from quite a small intervention from a quite simple tool. Um, so it's been really, really interesting to see you know, how that goes. So it's so good to hear from Europe as well. Um, and we need to hear more from you and good luck with all the work you do with those refugees and in midwifery. Thank you so much for, for joining us. So now you, we're moving we're moving on. And um, I want to introduce Matthew. And Matthew, you can say more about you, um, but we know that you're at the Witwatersrand University um, in South Africa, and uh, you're really working on climate change and the impact, particularly of heat, um, on women and babies. And I want to add that you're just such a great, guy to work with because you totally get midwifery you know what we can do and you talk to us a lot and um so please say anything else about yourself before just taking us through some main points we really want midwives to understand about climate change the impact on mothers and babies and what they can do so over to you matthew thanks excellent thank you friend um it's always a great pleasure to work with you and your team um and that i used to work in in obstetrics and with midwives for for some years, so I'm very well aware of, um, of, of the vital work that. Um, oh, no, that yeah, no. <laughs> Could I? Um, that one is, yeah, yeah, my head is a slight echo. So, um, what I want to start off by by giving a, a quite a, a um, overview. <clears throat> and if you look at the at, at the left of this of this figure, it shows the different manifestations of climate change. And here, raised temperature and heat waves, but also increased precipitation with typh um, typhoons or cyclones, for example, wildfires, rising sea levels, and also droughts, obviously. So those, and all of that occurs within a particular social, economic, and cultural context. So in other words, the climate change may be the same, of the same nature, but its impact will depend on where, um, where that is occurring and what that context is. So within with those um, changes in climate that can result in a disruption of health services, these direct uh, impacts on on pregnant women and and newborns, and of course climate change has a large um, mental health um, conditions, and I think this will become increasingly apparent as as climate change worsens, as a stress, anxiety, depression, and of course there's indirect impacts through failed crops and malnutrition, and all of these then in turn can affect maternal and, and newborn health. The area, as, as Fran mentioned, the area that that, that I think is um, is really important to to think through as um, as a health system and in obstetric or, or maternal health services is around heat. 
and you know, high ambient temperatures or heat waves. And I think for those who've been following Pakistan and the India heat wave recently, if you have a sense of of many of the maternity wards in those in those settings are really poorly resistant to heat. They were built at at a time when temperatures were a few degrees lower than than they are now, and where heat waves were very very rare. So in these kind of buildings, the material is poorly reflective, so they actually absorb heat. Um, in this case, the black roof. So the temperatures indoors, inside this facility, will be um, three or four degrees warmer than outdoors. Often there's poor ventilation, um, and women. Um, it, then in these, for in, in terms of the health health workforce, at these higher temperatures, um, it's really discomfort, and you have a lot of heat related symptoms, and that can include headaches and um, really a, a, a sense of unease that one gets at these very high temperatures, and that in turn affects your your work performance um, and the patient interactions. At, at those high temperatures. So with with some minor modifications to to the built environment and the natural environment, as well as some additional um, clinical interventions, many of the problems in the previous slide can can be addressed. So starting from the, the outer part of this figure, the, um, the greening is a is a really um, one of our key cooling strategies, trees, trees and other forms of shade and trans, transpiration have a, can really lower temperatures by, by um, many degrees. A white reflective paint, um, again, um, will, will ensure that the inside of a building is cooler than outside, which, which should really be um, the, the basic minimum that would aim for with a, with a building envelope. And then uh, ventilation through windows, rational use of air conditioning, a fan, a simple fan with um, water spray is also very effective. And and care for the midwife and healthcare workers is is um, is really a key part of responding to um, increased temperatures within health facilities. And that we can't we need to focus not only on the, the effects of heat on on women during a labor and childbirth, but also the effects um, on the well-being and on the work performance of midwives and other staff. To take a, a broader approach, so I, so I think heat during childbirth or labor is really probably an area we need to focus most on, but I think a whole pregnancy approach um, is, is important to consider. So even preconception, and here are some people in hot areas of the world um, to promote a, um, a conception or beginning a pregnancy during the hot season. So then in the cooler part of the year, um, when you're in third trimester, um, you know, that's kind of the winter or autumn seasons. Um, and of course, within climate change, there are there are these ongoing debates around the importance of population um, growth or family planning and planned pregnancies, etc. But in terms of midwife and obstetric care, so in the first trimester, I think it's important to identify high-risk women uh, in terms of heat, so that's this women who are obese or got diabetes or um, above the age of 35 or got twins, for example, those are women who are at higher risk of heat-related conditions during pregnancy. And I think to advise women to avoid extreme heat, especially occupational settings and and sports, etc. But and and in particularly for women, in many areas needed to fetch wood or to fetch um, a water. Um, you know, uh, uh, traveling often over long distances in the heat is a major problem. And in the second trimester, again here, I think to re-emphasize that high and extreme heat need to be avoided um, and and to begin to prepare for complication um, complications if there's a heat wave. How to, if, there's, if, it's, if the temperature is above 40 degrees, for example, and you're going to into labor, then how does one um, get what what transport, for example, do you use to get to your health facility? And heat and mental health, as I mentioned, um, there's a major impact on on your stress or your level of aggression or anxiety uh, when it's hot. So we also need to bear that in mind during the second trimester, I think. Um, and then during the third trimester, here we really are trying to avoid um, heat exposure. You want to be in a mild um, temperature zones during the third trimester. Uh, early warning systems and then tiered interventions, I think, in the third trimester, really important 
Um, and something that's really it is beginning to be to to be um, advanced as a, as a key strategy is a cooling center. So this would be um, it's analogous to a maternal waiting home in some ways, where you would have a an area that's dedicated just for women in the third trimester or those with very high risk uh, pregnancies, where they are able to stay in a room that has air conditioning or good ventilation or um, cold water available. Um, and, and a painted in white reflective paint, for example. So, and I think that's that's something that would really um, become more and more important over time. Really, a dedicated cool area for for women um, at high risk during heat waves. And then during childbirth, as as I said, this is a time when there's a lot of heat being generated um, in a labour over eight or ten hours, or um, there's a whole lot of uh, heat generated by uterine contractions and the amount of exertion that's required and often accompanied by dehydration or, or bleeding, etc., hemorrhage, etc. So this is important that hydration, water supplementation, again, cooling and infections. We know that during warmer parts, you know, as temperature increases, so does food, waterborne um, and a reproductive tract infections increase. So here, group B strep, the coccus is really important in childbirth. And postpartum, there's um, breastfeeding is, uh, much less uh, discomfort. With, there's more discomfort with breastfeeding during extreme periods of extreme heat. The neonatal sepsis and postpartum sepsis in women. These are those are the the kinds of um, conditions we should we should be aware of. Uh, lastly, um, none, no midwife or, or or public health or solely solely provide clinical care. We we move way beyond that. And a very a figo and others have. And many organizations have begun to really focus on on climate change from a advocacy and, and from a, um, a sense that we really need to respond to the need of, of women and 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 children. So the, the, the lovely phrase, the health impacts of the global climate crisis on maternal and child health can no longer be ignored. And they set out in this in this um, poster, they set out the problem very clearly, but they also move on to note that um, what we can do and they center this around advocacy, I think. And from a health perspective and um, maternal and newborn health, there's really a lot of, we have a lot of um, a leverage or a lot of credibility, or we have a, a very, um, a, a, a voice that people listen to and that we can really advance advocacy. And um, Figo and, this, uh, and Heal and others, we were really among the first to, to really push divestment from fossil fuels from a health perspective. So there's a lot that the health sector can do as this problem really begins to expand. And and um, it's a major crisis in the world, but there is a lot that we can do. Thanks, Fred. Still on mute, Fran. Talking to myself again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just want to say, Matthew, thank you so much. It's a really brief but important uh, piece of work here. And I think as midwives, we have no choice but now to get much uh, more involved in this uh, and move forward. So we really rely on you for this information and to, and to keep us up to date as well. So thanks a million. Now I'm going to hand over to Annie Portella. Um, from the Maternal Newborn Child Adolescent Health and Aging Department in WHO, which is where I sit as well, and hot off the press. I'm really, really excited um, because postnatal care, as Matthew's, um, Matthew mentioned, is, is a really big issue. And um, we haven't previously had such a brilliant uh, recommendations on maternal newborn care for positive postnatal experience. And Annie's joined by Mercedes Bonnet, who is from the Sexual and Reproductive Health Department. Uh, at WHO too. So over to you two for some really exciting updates on this. Thanks. Thank you so much, Fran. And thanks to all of you. We're really happy to share in the celebration with you. Uh, congratulations on this day. Uh, and special thanks to the organizer for allotting us um, time to share information with you about the newly released WHO recommendation on maternal and newborn care for a positive postnatal experience. And I'm Annie and, I, and uh, my colleague Mercedes. And what we'll do is just take you through a few um, 
a few snippets uh, to lure you into then finding the guideline on the web and, and reading it and using it in your practice. Uh, you'll see the link here. So when you have the slides, hopefully you can access it. Uh, Fran said it well, postnatal care of the maternity care continuum uh, is the most neglected coverage and quality lag, um, lag behind global targets. Um, as uh, facility births have gone up and, and births with skilled professionals have gone up, length of stay in health facilities after birth vary widely across countries and in many places women do not stay long enough to receive adequate care and support to transition to home. Uh, while antenatal care has gone up over the last years, postnatal care remains one of the lowest levels of coverage across the con continuum, both for the women and for the newborn. The guideline has 63 recommendations. There are 31 new and updated recommendations and 32 integrated recommendations, so integrated from existing guidelines. So hopefully you can find uh, all the information you need in one publication. We've divided the recommendations or they're grouped according to maternal care, newborn care, and health systems and health promotion interventions. And I'm going to pass over to Mercedes, who's just gonna take you through some of, uh, some of the key recommendations. Thanks, Annie. So, um, what I will be uh, presenting is just a quick snapshot on what is in the guideline. So as um, Annie just mentioned, we have three main areas. So on maternal care, we have recommendations around maternal assessments, also interventions for common physical signs and symptoms, as well as preventive measures for common problems such as mastitis or constipation. We, it's the first time that WHO issues recommendations around maternal mental health. And we have two um, recommendations on screening for um, and prevention of depression and anxiety. And there's also recommendations around use of um, micro, um, iron supplementation and physical activity. Very important, we also have integrated recommendations around postpartum contraception. Moving to the newborn care, we have structured the recommendations in a similar way. So recommendations for newborn assessment, preventive measures, nutritional interventions, as well as recommendations to promote infant growth and development. You can go to the next slide. The third section in this guideline is around health systems and health promotion interventions. So we have updated recommendations around the schedules for postnatal care contacts, length of stay in facilities after birth. For the first time also, recommendations around what are the criteria that should be assessed before discharge from health facilities after birth, as well as um, updated recommendations on home visits for postnatal care contacts. And then on um, the right side of the slide, there's recommendations that have been integrated from other guidelines that, that, but that are very much relevant to postnatal care, including midwifery continuity of care from pregnancy through intrapartum up to the postnatal period, task sharing components of postnatal care, recruitment and retention of staff in rural and remote areas, involvement of men in postnatal care, home use of home-based record, and also use of digital target, client communication and digital birth notifications. Next slide, please. So all these recommendations come together in the WHO postnatal care model and uh, is the figure that you can see on the right hand side of the slide. And as you can see, the woman and the baby are at the center of um, the care that is provided through um, facility-based 
care after birth up to discharge and then continuous care in the community or at home for the first weeks after birth. This model aims to achieve a postnatal, positive postnatal experience that is defined in the guideline and one in which women, newborns, the partners, parents, caregivers and families receive information and reassuring from health providers. And this most certainly includes midwives and that both the woman and the baby's health, social and developmental needs are recognized with a resource and flexible health system that respect their cultural context. And all this is, of course, included in this postnatal care model. I think that that's um, the last slide that we have. And I will be passing over to Fran. So huge thanks, Annie and Mercedes. That was really super. Again, just a snapshot, but speaking as a midwife myself and knowing others online, postnatal care is just the most wonderful part of midwifery. The woman's got through the birth. She's there, the baby's there, the family's there, the partner's there. It's just full of love and affection and excitement. So these recommendations couldn't be more timely and more important, and we all want them, and we all want to start implementing them. And I spoke to midwives in the Nordic region today from other parts of the world. They apply to everybody. So your work has been fantastic, and it's great to have you both uh, with us and supporting us midwives take this forward. Thanks a lot to both. Now, in the interest of time, I'm just going to just do a couple more slides um, as to where we're moving forward. And I just wanted you to know that we have all been working for some time on an interprofessional midwifery education toolkit. And this is for people who have qualified, so it's continual professional development. It's about bringing all the materials together based on the WHO recommendations and making learning fun and interesting and self-directed and challenging. We have power walks and we have videos and we have um, treasure hunts to get the recommendations and all kinds of activities. So it's just to say there are facilitator and learner guides coming. It's blended. You can do quite a lot online before you even start, um, but you do need to come in and work with each other as a team interprofessionally as we've been discussing to see how you can improve that quality of care as well as what you do. It's based on a continuity of care midwifery model. So it's bye-bye to simulation labs that are just about looking at a placenta and then a woman's vagina, and then resuscitating a baby. This is following the woman, her partner, the baby, all the way through the process. Um, and there's antenatal coming. Childbirth is just launched. We're just getting all those information up on the website. Now the postnatal care guidelines are out. We can really get working on that. Sexual reproductive health, very good comprehensive abortion care module coming out. There's a wonderful cross-cutting module on essential respectful care takes you through why it's happening, what's happening, how we can stop it, how do we recognise, what can we do about it, and what are our human rights as midwifery care providers, as well as what are the rights of the women, newborn and her family, newborn included, and her family. So hugely informative and exciting. A perinatal mental health course coming, which will link in well to those postnatal care guidelines. And very interestingly, after the discussions on leadership from Sierra Leone, for example, we will be developing an essential midwifery leadership course for people to take, not an academic course, um, but we're working with those five countries who are feeding into us what it is that they need. We've learning from a course we ran in India, and we're going to put out something for everyone to review. That is, this is what people want at countries. Now let's take it forward. So that's really, really interesting and exciting work. And then, of course, there's lots of other courses in WHO. This midwifery education toolkit is about healthy women and babies. It's about what midwives do best and mostly. But we link to all the emergency obstetric care courses. We link to maternal perinatal death surveillance course. Very important that midwives are involved. Small and sick newborns, violence against women and women health worker courses, really good. Postpartum family planning, HIV, malaria, TB, etc. So all coming into one place very soon. And just to say, um, all based, the childbirth care course coming up first is based on all these recommendations. Um, and when we come to the postnatal care, of course, it will be based on the postnatal care recommendations. But they dive into those recommendations, they find out what they are, they dive into the new labour care guide, they start to use it for the three women that we care for right the way through labour, childbirth and the newborn care. So they get to know the evidence, they get to feel confident, empowered, know where to find it, know how to use it and apply it. 
and, and this is what it looks like. There's facilitators guides that start with an introductory module, how to teach differently, how to learn differently in the learner guide, um, labor first stage, second stage, third stage, and um, immediate newborn care. And then a really important new one altogether about appropriate respectful referral. And that is a WHO quality of care standard that we've turned into a guide to make sure that if something does happen, you stay with her, you communicate, you document, you work as a team, you care for her until she is referred. So it's a really exciting course. The online materials will come out first, so you can all access it for free and use them. And, and this will be the website. So just keep your eyes open for that. And so now just to finish off, we want you all to join our global nursing and midwifery leadership community of practice. This evolves quickly. I think I've just heard that this slide is already out of date, but it really is set up by midwives and nurses for midwives and nurses. Many of us are extremely isolated and uh, it doesn't matter where you are, that's what I can tell you. Um, and you know, many are in such remote areas, they don't have internet connection. They're called a chief government nursing midwifery officer or something. They have no budget, no laptop. They're not invited to meetings. They don't have a work plan. And this is where we can all get connected. It involves ICN, ICM, nurses, midwives, the WHO Academy, um, and many more. Um, there's a very uh, strong steering committee. They're already running webinars, multilingual webinars. So Matthew's work on climate change has already been up there with even more depth and detail. There's a lot going on on this website. So what I want you to do, please, is to connect. Uh, you can set up your own group. You can join other groups. You can talk about what you want. You can ask what you want. So you just literally Google nursingmidwiferyglobal.org. You can make your comments and suggestions on it. And Emily McWhirt has done an amazing job in setting this up from scratch, and it's really moving forward fast. It is the global platform where we'll put our education materials, where everything else that you need to know, whether it's postnatal care guidelines, the latest in this, climate change, et cetera, will be there. So with that, it's now time to um, end this. And I'm here. Unfortunately, Elizabeth has had to go um, for, for personal reasons. Um, but I know what she had to say was an absolute massive thank you to all the participants. Um, getting uh, people in countries without internet to sit in internet cafes to create videos. Uh, it's really, really hard to get these, these videos from ministries of health who are incredibly busy. So thank you to all the participants and, and Annie and Mercedes and Irina um, and Matthews. And a huge thank you to VIDM for organising us <laughs> and making us Get, get all this together. Um, and most importantly, thank you to all midwives everywhere. As you heard the DG say, you matter to us. You are hugely valued and you are just brilliant. So thank you so much. Take care, everybody, and bye from us. Over to you, Jane. Thanks. Thanks, Fran. So I think we can give a, a massive thank you. Big hearts to the World Health Organization. I, I think I was seeing some comments there and there's as Toro bless you blessings it was so good I think you know as the pandemic has brought us all together and we're talking a lot about bringing us back together that all the sections that we had uh, presented today so relevant for all of us wherever we are midwives um, you know I, I love the the film I think it was from Bolivia it was incredible the information about climate change the importance of leadership having equitable resources for all of us and thank you to Chris there's lots of um, information there in the chat box and I don't know I know it's very late for some of you and very early for some of you in the world I don't know if any would be willing to take maybe a, a question uh, or two if there's any specific questions or um, make sure you check out the links here and we'll, we'll certainly be um, posting them on vidm.org as well so that everyone will be able to have equitable access to all the wonderful links and information that you've shared. So thank you. I think we had a, we had a great turnout, and uh, especially for those of you that are here in the middle of your night, we appreciate you uh, getting up early and late. And uh, happy happy International Day as a midwife uh, to you all. <laughs>